This is the Dream Journal, and I am Catherine Bell. Welcome to KSQD Santa Cruz. Sweet dreams till sunbeams find you. Sweet dreams. Good morning. You are listening to live to KSQD Santa Cruz, K Squid 90.7 FM, streaming live at ksqd.org. I am Catherine Bell, and this is the Dream Journal a weekly show where we explore the healing power of your nighttime dreams through conversations with dream experts and with you. Today, we are live in the studio with local inspirational speaker, author, and workshop leader, Greg Lavoie. We will talk about how your dreams help you find what you are passionate about, and then also focus in on the topic of why dreams are so uncomfortable so often. Have you ever had the experience of not wanting to explore certain dreams? This is Catherine Bell of Experiential Dream Work, and welcome to the Dream Journal. I'd like to remind you that the views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or of KSQD staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Please check out the Dream Journal podcast. Look for it, review it, subscribe, and tell your friends. New episodes will be released within a few days of every broadcast. I'm inviting Collins today in the final segment of your show, so get your questions ready and queue up your phone to 831-900-5773. That's 900-KSQD. I'd love to hear about one of your dreams, or you could ask a question. Jot the number down, and you can call us in just a little while. That number again is 831-900-5773. I'd also like to let you know that next week, the week between Christmas and New Year's, will be a call-in only show. So, I'm taking the plunge. Come on, callers, give us a call. So next week, December 28th, call-in only. You don't have to worry about interrupting a guest. It's all about you. So the dream that I've been mulling over today is this just part of a dream. You know, so often happens, there's lots happening in a dream, and there, but there's one moment that kind of like stands out and so the moment that stands out to me is a moment of sitting on a stage. I'm sitting with uh, my dear friend, and I feel like maybe I'm younger than usual, and like we're like kids together, and we're sitting on the edge of the stage, dangling our feet over the edge, and we're outdoors. It's an outdoor stage, uh, kind of at the top of a hill, looking out over a community. I see like smoke curling up from one of the houses, and like a chimney of one of the houses, and and it's this like, really peaceful moment. And up on the stage behind us, I, I, I can see or I'm aware of these board games and um, like stacks of rubber banded money, which is interesting. But it makes me think like life or Monopoly, something I've spent a lot of time as a child playing board games with my siblings. I had three siblings, so the four of us did a lot of uh, games together. And it's interesting that we're sitting, I'm sitting on a stage. And I have a lot of stage dreams. It's really quite a theme for me to be on stage. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting my lines or I'm singing or I'm not singing or I'm uh, um, naked. You know, all these different things that happen on stage or maybe I'm backstage. It's just really a real theme for me. But this one really stands out because there's like a sense of peacefulness, which is not that familiar to me on stage or really in waking life. I, I have a lot of I do have peacefulness. Let me rephrase that. I do have a lot of peacefulness. Oh, just take a breath into that. Because I get into these certain modes where I start rushing and and I forget. I feel like I've never been peaceful, you know, but it's not it's not true. There's actually a lot of time when I'm I'm peaceful. So there's something about being on stage without an audience. You know, there's people out there, but they're not really paying attention. I'm just like a kid on the edge of the stage banging my heels against the side, you know, makes that boom boom sound. So there's something new here for me about being on stage but not having to perform. I get to play. <laughs> and that's what I wish for the Dream Journal, really, is, is that a chance for me to, you know, it is a stage of a sort. It's absolutely a stage. And yet I get to play. I get to share my dreams and talk to amazing dream people about dreams, things I'm so passionate about. So that's what I'm bringing with me to the show today. So we have Greg Lavoy here live in the studio. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Yes, I was thinking this is uh, the first time I've actually had a repeat guest. You are my first oh, repeat guest. All right. I'm on. Uh, yeah, so we, I had another interview with Greg uh, back in April, and I do have that on tape. And one of these days, I'm going to upload it to my podcast series so you can listen to the original interview. But today is a new conversation. 
Greg Lavoie has written two books, Callings, Finding and Following an Authentic Life, and Vital Signs, Discovering and Sustaining Your Passion for Life. He is a lecturer and seminar leader in the business, educational, governmental, faith-based, and human potential arenas, and has keynoted and presented workshops at venues ranging from the EPA, Microsoft and British Petroleum, to universities, churches, and Esalen, as well as a workshop coming up the first weekend in January at our own 1440 University. So, welcome, Greg. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So, we spent a lot of time in the last interview talking about Callings uh, and that original book and the, that uh, that piece of, of the work that you do. And I, I wondered, you know, we have some topics to get to, but I was wondering if we wanted to talk a little bit about Vital Signs, your, your, uh, your other book about finding and sustaining passion in life. Just. Mm-hmm to kind of like introduce our listeners to who you are and what you do. Ah, okay. Mm. Yeah, and the uh, vital signs work is really about the subject of passion. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And I suspect that taps into what you shared at the top of the hour here about mm. having all these dreams about being on stage. That does obviously something about that that yeah. taps into something that you're here to do, mm-hmm. <laughs> clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, so the work is really just about helping people identify where passion shows up in their life and where it disappears. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I may segue, your opening um, piece with one of the topics I think we're, we're going to um, rap about today about why we're afraid of dreams. Um, this is a stage dream. Mm. And this leads, I think, into the conversation. Perfect. Um, I And this is a very short dream. I, my uh, first book had just come out, um, literally the night that it came out and I got the box from UPS full of the copies of my very first book, which I carried into the house the way I imagine Pharaoh's daughter must have carried the basket with Moses. <laughs> it was that kind of a moment. Mm. But that night I had a, a, frankly, a nightmare mm. about being up on a stage in front of a big audience and on the table in front of me was a copy of that book that looked like somebody had put it through a meat grinder. Mm. And um, the word obit was written on the on the cover. And I woke up terrified mm. because I realized I was desperately attached to the fate of that book. Um, and that sending it out into the world is what I imagine parents go through sending their kid to kindergarten for the first time or something. <laughs> it's like, is the world going to like the book? Uh, is it going to sell? Is it going to pay back my advance? Is it going to t- catapult the book into the 5 to 10% of books that statistically make money? Mm. All that. And I, the dream was telling me I was, ter- I was attached. I was terribly attached. And that what I needed to do was practice something my whole life has been telling me to practice, which is letting go, mm-hmm. surrendering, not being in control. And so what I did as a way to ritualize that dream was I took a copy of that book out of the box. I wrote my obituary on the title page where I would um, henceforth be signing my name for people. And I tore the book to shreds with my bare hands. I cracked the spine. I mm. broke the cardboard. I tore the pages apart, and then I burned it in my fireplace, wow. which prompted my mother to declare that I was weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but what I love about this dream is that it was scary to look at how attached I was. I just wanted to sail out into the world with the book and just mm. stand on stages and you know um, hold forth. But the dream was telling me I had work to do that I didn't want to do, which was let go of control of the book and and surrender. It's interesting that surrender was the theme because what's the word that writers use to describe the act of sending their writing out to editors? Submission. Oh, submission. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> so oh. here is a dream telling me, and, and and I say this because I remember the novelist Tom Robbins. Remember him? Mm-hmm. He said, dreams don't come true. Mm. They are true. Mm. So they have real information, real data, real uh, emotions, real impact, and real consequences if we ignore them. And this explains why dreams are sometimes scary and unnerving for us. Because they tell us, I think, this is my experience, Mm -hmm. what we really know about something. Uh, What we uh really feel about something. What changes maybe we need to make to, to stay in integrity with ourselves. And and that's scary for the same reason 
introspection is scary, mm. um, personal growth workshops, therapy, mm. because they're all, we have to face ourselves. Yeah. And dreams are expert at that, right? Yeah, exactly. I love that dreams don't come true, dreams are true. Right. Mm -hmm. But we have to face ourselves and the truth of ourselves. Um, and that's the, the kind of information I experience dreams to be bringing me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the famous saying, the truth shall set you free. Yeah, they don't say that first it's going to scare the daylights <laughs> out of you. Well, I've heard another version of that. The truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Yeah, that's great. If I can say that on the air. <laughs> right. Yeah, is that one of those words that uh, Carlin said we were allowed to say or not allowed? <laughs> um, but th that explains a lot about mm -hmm. why people are reticent to first of all practice dream recall and bring them on mm. and then work with them and and honor them and uh follow the the dictates that sometimes dreams pass along to us interesting you use the word dictates because like i immediately went to dictator dictator i know and it's like there is something about that though that we don't want to submit we don't want to like do the submission to what's true right even if it's true right yeah i mean it's interesting that i chose that word dictate yeah. um but they won't go away. It's not like they'll necessarily dictate our lives, but they won't go away. Mm. That's also my experience of dreams. They'll, if I ignore them, they'll keep coming back in one fashion or another. And if not, and here's another scary aspect of dreams, I think, um, if we don't honor the information that's in them, mm -hmm. our unconscious will find another channel to bring that, that data to us. And it'll be like body symptoms mm -hmm. or neuroses or, you know, obsessions or compulsions, things like the body, the, the psyche will find a way to get that data to us. Mm. Um, right, right. Well, and it's, it's interesting that we, I always come back to the fact that we don't remember most of our dreams. Right. And there's plenty of people who don't remember any dreams or like very rarely but the dreams still have a purpose and a function, and there is a way they are still bringing things to our attention, even if we don't remember them. So I'm curious, what what are all the stage dreams about over the course of your life? What do you mean? Oh, the stage dreams. Oh. I mean, what is that telling you? You know, it's been different things over the years, but it, they're usually some kind of invitation. Like one of the early dreams that I had when I was getting deep into this, uh, this feeling-based dream work, archetypal dream work, was was a dream where I, I'm on stage and I'm wearing an evening gown and the lights are on me and there's people in the audience and I'm there's a man playing the piano and looking lovingly into my eyes. Uh, mm. And there's just this beautiful feeling of connection as he plays the piano and he looks at me and I feel totally comfortable on stage just standing there gazing into his eyes. And, and there's something really amazing about that moment of like letting in the love and letting people see me uh, on stage mm. here and... You know, I, I still get a, a, a rush of, of how powerful that is that I'm like letting myself be loved and accepted. Wow. But it took my dream person, the, guy, the person I was working with at that time, it was uh, Sue Scavo, Students of the Dream. And uh, she said, well, you know, this is a beautiful moment. And step back and look at the scene. Like you're there in an evening gown with someone playing the piano. Like, is there an invitation here? And I'm like... Oh, it's like a Billy Holiday moment. Like, <laughs> like it's an invitation to sing. And we, one of the things that dreams do is they bring up things that we don't want to do. Don't want to do. No, I mean I've always been. I always love to sing, but I've always like part of a choir, and I like to be like one of many voices. And maybe in the shower. Oh, in the shower, that's the best. <laughs> exactly, but but to be alone on stage, to be highlighted in stage and supported, but but highlighted in this way was like, oh, I'm never going to do that. Oh, yeah. But it was, and it took, you know, weeks and months for the, for me to really submit to that dream. But there was a way that I, I found myself writing songs, songs about my dreams. No. And I found opportunities to sing those songs and to share them like acapella on, uh, with, in front of other people and in various groups. And I found it was incredibly powerful in connecting myself to my body and that the singing mm. resonates through your whole body. And so uh, it, uh, it's been a lifelong quest for me to be more connected to my body. I'm an intellectual type. I'm very heady. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, um, it's been a lifelong journey. And there was, so for years after that dream, I did find places where I could sing solo 
And it found it extremely helpful in my inner life, kind of finding my voice. So like where waking life becomes a metaphor, not just dream. So, so the, I've, I didn't want to go there, though. I'm like, you're kidding me. I'm not well, gonna. yeah, I mean, <laughs> partly because getting up on a stage in front of people, whether you're singing or talking, is one of the great fears that people have. It's true. I, I've heard, heard some people say that uh, there's some, some statistic that people would statistically rather be... Uh, um, in the casket at a funeral <laughs> than standing at the delivering pulpit the eulogy. delivering the eulogy. <laughs> I think that's a Seinfeld line, isn't oh, is it? it? Maybe so. Like more afraid of, of, of speaking in public than, yeah. than of death. Right. And I heard somebody once say, actually a public speaking teacher of mine, mm -hmm. he said most people believe that the biggest fear people have is the fear of dying. And studies have shown that the number one fear is the fear of public speaking mm -hmm. and the number two fear is the fear of dying while public speaking. <laughs> Oh but you know this this um, thing about being on a stage though um that is that is so true mm. um that's that's one of the fears but so often people are called to step forward mm -hmm. and speak out loud yeah and share their work with the world in one way or another go public with it not hold it so close to their chest mm. and mm -hmm. I, I think some of these stage dreams are ways of our psyche calling us into being bigger yeah yeah um mm -hmm. and but you know i remember remember est oh yes okay oh. so i took est way back when and mm -hmm. one of the exercises they called the danger exercise mm -hmm. where you with a group of people uh, maybe 20 30 people at a time you stand up on a stage in front of the other participants and there might might have been hundreds of them and you stand up and the only instruction is just stand there mm -hmm. don't do anything um and the facilitator kept wandering back and forth um calling people on flipping their hair or cocking their hip or, or putting their hands or crossing their arms putting their hands on their hips and and when he stopped people from all that distractive behavior people started to break down mm. they started to tremble i started to tremble um mm. people started to cry and these are just grown-ups professional mm. people all we're doing is standing in front of a, an audience mm. doing nothing we mm. don't even have to talk or sing mm. just standing there so these dreams of being on stages are yeah. They're formidable. Yeah, that's very powerful to be seen. Mm. So we're going to go to a quick break now. We'll be right back. And in about 20 minutes, I will open the phone. So go ahead and call in. Oh, well, in, in about 15, 20 minutes, call in 831-900-5773. You can share a dream you're curious about or ask a question. We are speaking to Greg Lavoie. This is the Dream Journal on K-Squid 90.7 FM. And I am your host, Catherine Bell. Fly me high. Good morning. I'm Catherine Bella, and this is the Dream Journal. We are here live with Greg Lavoie. So, welcome back, Greg. Thank you. Mm -hmm, a lively conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Good topic. Yeah. So, you were saying something about feeling. Yeah, based. you had, you had mentioned during the break something about um, being feeling based. Um, the dreams are feeling based, or your approach to them was feeling based. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the challenges also, one of the reasons that people are um, afraid perhaps to open the lid and look at dreams is that th their proof that this is especially for people who are kind of habituated or cemented to a rational view of the world. As, uh, as are we all or so <laughs> right. frequently. Oh my God. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. And the whole culture is wired that way. But for yeah. those kind of people, dreams are, they're wild. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're proof that there's another psychic reality if you will that is probably deeper than the one we generally steer our courses by such as logic and reason and so anybody who's got a scientific or a rational or a linear um viewpoint on life or or they're just they're attached to the ego or even the five senses dreams are really watery stuff under there under the ice mm. and um so I was wondering, because your background is astrophysics. That's right. 
you know, so I don't know which came first, this rational view view of the world or the astrophysics, but I'm wondering, so now you're doing dream work. <laughs> and how, yeah. how was that transition for somebody who's very rationally scientifically oriented to to get into this feeling based world right that would be seem to be a little scary oh absolutely uh very scary i mean i i've discovered over the years that the the you know i'm definitely a scientist i have a phd in astrophysics i worked for nasa for 11 years right. and so there is a way that i'm very functional in that that part of my brain it, it and yet i found that in some ways that that part of that part of my who I am is kind of a crust over the feeling part of who I am. Hmm. And I was, I remember quite a few dreams from, from childhood. There's like four or five dreams that are still meaningful to me from, from childhood that I never, you know, I never, there was no forum for me to share that. There was no way that that was something that I could really talk about as a child. It wasn't hmm. like part of the family culture. Oh, what did you dream about last night? You know, that. <laughs> I was uh, thought that that sounds lovely. Although it's interesting with my my own son, he knows I'm so invested in dreams that he doesn't share any dreams with me, which is fine. Oh, um, uh, so it's it's interesting that. Um, but I, I found that that I was very functional at science, and it was some way that I could feel successful. And so I was like, math is is easy for me it feels good my mm. math brain is something i enjoy i actually enjoy math puzzles to this day i just enjoy for fun okay solving equations and like you know partial differential equations and deriving things it's like fascinating i love it wow that and put, that puts me into a coma <laughs> for, for me it was it was it was uh it feels like it's successful like it scratches a certain itch in a certain part of my brain right. and yet i found that it wasn't that satisfying and that as i got into nasa and i was actually hired as a civil servant and and i once i found my niche and kind of settled in i was like this is just not doing it for me it mm. just wasn't satisfying i found it was uh, kind of sterile like i would be driving equ the same equations over and over again like well i didn't quite get the coefficient to come out right or you know something mm. and so i i ended up um helping out with uh um being a branch chief. I was the assistant branch chief for a, for a while. And actually, I was surprised to find it was satisfying to work with people, which is not part of my story. My part of my story is that I'm an introvert, I'm very nerdy, and I uh -huh. like numbers, I don't like people. But right. turns out, I actually really like people. Mm. And, and <laughs> yeah, who knew? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and even the introvert part, I'm, I'm having to kind of rethink, because it just doesn't seem like it fits that well. Mm. But there was a lot of success that I had in the world based on my scientific self right and the the thinking that i that i did but when i you know i couldn't sustain it and like i was i, I was found that I, I i couldn't literally feel things in my body like i could take care of myself and i would think like i'm dragging my body around like i guess i have to exercise now and mm. that kind of thing but i had a huge wake-up call and listeners have probably heard this story because it's um it was so transformative for me that in 2005, uh, I was up in Hood River, Oregon on a windsurfing vacation, and I had a, um, a couple of three days of intense and increasing pain in my gut, which I ignored. I was mm. like, I, I felt it. I mean, it wasn't like I didn't feel it, but I was like, uh, I'll be fine. It's no big deal. You know, I, I'll be okay. And what happened is my appendix ruptured. Oh. And I almost died. It was actually very close. The doctor said it was like a very serious rupture and, you know, few more hours and I could have been it for me and I had this huge wake-up call alone in the hospital because all the people I was traveling with left to go home they had to go home and I had this wake-up call that that all is not right in the world you know my body is had to go to such lengths to get my attention and so there was something that really had to shift and I was had been interested in dreams been doing dream groups for a while but I really stepped it up at that point and I started to Say that this, I need to make friends with my body. And it kind of approached it like a wild beast for a while, you know, mm. that I had to make friends. And the, the dreams would, would come and be helpful. And a lot of the dreams are very uncomfortable. And part of what I came to terms with is sometimes my body's uncomfortable. Yeah. And there's useful information there. Instead of just ignoring it, I needed to pay attention to that. And I slowly learned to do that. Uh huh. So how do you approach a wild beast? Ah, uh, very carefully. <laughs> and with songs, maybe, singing, soothing the wild beast. Oh, uh, interesting. Because there is something very embodied about singing. And then uh, the phase I went through of all the singing that I did really did embody me, put me into my body. Because it resonates up and down your whole organism and all the way to the floor. Mm. 
up through the top of your head and your arms and it just engages your feelings in a way that at least for me it engaged my feelings in a way that was very very powerful well wow. it's interesting that you use the example of the body thing because that to me seems like an analog for people's fear of dreams is um the when you get a symptom that's disturbing people are inclined to i'm not going to go to the i'm just i don't want to know yeah right <laughs> there's an element of that in people's relationship to their bodies when they get disturbing symptoms is i i don't i don't want to know what mm -hmm. if it's something terrible mm -hmm. what if it's going to make me change my life in some radical fashion and I think we have a similar thing. I have a similar thing around my dreams. Absolutely. Like that. It's like, ooh, I'm not sure I want to go there. Yeah, I have this nice, you know, don't upset my apple cart. You know, I've got all these apples stacked <clears> up neatly, <throat> and I did this job at NASA and all this stuff, and it just poof, it all tipped yeah. over. Yeah. yeah, so here's an example from my files of what you just described. Yeah. Um, I had a period of my life some years ago where I was in a funk with a capital F, which is not something I'm generally prone to. And I was listless, I was restless, I was bored, I was disconnected. I was as close to the state of depression as I ever get. And again, I'm not generally prone to that state. And then I had a dream that was one of those wild animal dreams. I dreamed that I was going down an old, walking down an old disused road on my own property. And suddenly way down the road, I saw a black dragon come flying into view. Mm enormous black dragon and he flew right toward me and i i just was like a skittering rabbit looking for a hole to duck into and i couldn't find one and suddenly the dragon is right above me he's looking down with this enormous like tyrannosaurus rex head on uh, these i remember these amber eyes and just hovering over me not doing anything not coming after me just hovering over me and i was so scared it woke me up wow you know those dreams that you're so frightened your heart is pounding you wake up absolutely and what i interpreted that to mean is the dragon this wild incredibly wild ancient creature was my writing oh it was mm. my writing that I was ignoring. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it was on an old disused road <laughs> and uh, mm. on my own property. Mm. And I was uh, all involved in this dry academic writing at the time, researching, third person researching, interviewing, uh, this kind of writing. And I was neglecting my free writing practice. This is the daily sit down in front of a computer, let your unconscious go on a roll with a, with a keyboard under its fingers kind of writing. But the raw psychic stuff mm -hmm. you know the, the the ancient dragon kind of writing and i wasn't doing it and the dream was saying you need to start doing that mm. and that's that's scarier writing than the dry academic stuff that's you true know, the same reason that researching is easier than writing <laughs> you know <Right. laughs> uh, it just is um it's just not uh, moth to the flame stuff like the real writing is and so the dream again presenting information i i didn't want to go there i was i think i was afraid of what was in that real writing but it scared me awake uh -huh. that right. was what the dream did and so i'm just the the, the scarier the dream the more juicy it seems to me Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, I get it. People have to turn on the receiver at all and be willing to hear their dreams. But when a dream like that, that scares you awake, mm -hmm. um, that to me is uh, it's, part of me wants to go counterphobic on that. The thing you're scared of, go toward it, not away. Counterphobic. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're scared of heights. Jump out of an airplane, <laughs> you know, well, with a parachute. Well, hopefully, yes. <laughs> yes right. um, but, you know, this, yeah. there's something about this that's and I I offer people a generous bow to what I'm suggesting when I say turn on the receiver be willing to look at the dreams especially when they tell you that what you need to be doing to change your life to make it better because you're not it's not about status quo mm. I mean isn't it one of the truths of dream work that they tell us stuff we don't consciously know it's true it's true like with a dream people say oh I know what that dream means and like well then we've just begun yes. we haven't really started opening it up yet right <laughs> exactly mm. and you know the people who are um, they're the rational, logical, I want evidence, I want this to be evidence-based. That kind of work is scary. It's disconcerting. That's why I was curious what your transition was like to doing the, the dream work after mm -hmm. being an astrophysicist and having the kind of brain that you have that functions so well in the rational world. Right, right. Well, I found that a lot of the transitions I've had over the years, certainly since I've been doing the dream work, have been foreshadowed in my dreams and that I didn't like I was doing my personal dream work for for years 
after my uh, appendix event and and then i had a, a dream where where uh it was just kind of like on the side i was actually doing work with a client like i was helping someone with their dreams and and the, the rest of the dream was about other things but there was like this moment when i was helping a dream someone else with a dream and and it was interesting because i i hadn't really considered being a practitioner at, at that point I hadn't you know a dream coach that there was i was doing my own work and it was powerful and i needed it uh but i hadn't considered that and and i had that dream and 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 then i had a few other dreams and it kind of like opened up for me the idea is like well maybe you know maybe maybe i could be a practitioner maybe i could work with other other folks dreams and i find other things have have been that way too and they're 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 usually for me they're not the you know the the one of being on the stage with a man playing piano was, was an exception where that was the centerpiece of the dream but often these foreshadowings are not the centerpiece of the dream there's something kind of off to the side like oh by the way yes i'm leading this retreat or by the way i'm leading this group of people or something but then if you kind of go through your dreams looking for for new things that are new then sometimes i i'll find these little hints of of what's to come or what could be right but the new i think naturally unnerves people it's yes. not the status quo right it's 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 and that's the whole point of callings frankly too is to pull you away from the status quo into a, a whole new frame of mind or a new direction but you're supposed to turn your back on day-to-day -day living on mulberry street life <laughs> stuff and turn to face something uh, greater than yourself. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, I went to Morocco years ago, first time I'd ever been in a Muslim country, and I actually got to see the calls mm. that are the thousands of years old in that culture from the criers up on top of the minarets. Oh, I see. Five times a day, uh -huh. they call, uh -huh. literally, they're calling people away from the daily grind, mm. whatever that is, you know, like tending to donkeys or making copper pots or whatever, <laughs> and to turn to Mecca, Mecca five times a day to pray. Mm. And I got you know, as a, like a Mr. Callings, I got to actually see <laughs> so one of the original forms of it. But the whole p purpose of it was stop what you're doing mm -hmm. and turn in the opposite direction and pray. Oh. Um, enter into a sacred frame of mind. And I think dreams are asking us to do something similar and stopping whatever you're doing to listen to your deeper marching orders mm. is an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it is. I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that, Greg. <laughs> Fantastic. So this is The Dream Journal, and you're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM, Community Radio of Santa Cruz. I am Catherine Bell. We are about to start our last segment, and I'd like to now welcome call-ins. So go ahead and pick up the phone. You can reach us here at 831-900-5773. That's 900 KSQD. Next week, remember, we will have a fully call-in show. So uh, you can also mark your calendar for that next week. But you're all welcome right now to give a call. Max is waiting, waving from the other room. for Take your call at 831-900-5773. What dreams do you have that you have been, uncom have been uncomfortable for you but have led to greater things? Come on, we gotta keep on. Welcome back to the Dream Journal. We are here in the studio live with Greg Lavoy. Hello. Hi. Ah, so many fascinating <laughs> conversations. You know, the, there's like a, we had a, um, there's a famous joke, which is, you know, the quickest way to end a conversation is to tell someone your dream. <laughs> have you ever heard that one? I have, yeah. <laughs> there's something about dreams that are so hard to hold on to. They're kind of slippery. Even if I'm a dream person and I'm fascinated by dreams, I have to like, pinch myself to keep listening because the dream has a logic of its own right. it, there's something about it that's just beyond our rational brains but i think also listening to other people's dreams is like listening to people do shop talk uh, that, that you don't understand it's like like not my monkeys not my circus kind of thing it's true i mean there's a whole different language each of us has a very different language 
And then there's these moments when, when I'm hearing someone's dream and it, it's like they're taking their clothes off because it, it's like, oh my God, is that like, what's I like I'm peering really oh. deeply into what's going on oh, for them. Absolutely. And they're like, oh, well, it's just this little thing. And uh, part of me is going, oh, wow, that's intense. Mm. Like sometimes I feel like I'm, when I'm working with somebody um, in a dream session, I feel like I'm kind of getting over to their side of the window. And like, what does it look like from your side when you're looking out? Like, what does it look like for you? And there's mm. a huge variety we speak the same language, we have similar bodies, but there's there's a big difference in the way we are in the world and the way you know we expect to be treated in the world. And this kind of kind of habits of, of mind. Is the universe a friendly place for you or not? For me, for years it was not a friendly place. Mm. It was like a place I could get through another day. And oh. that was very functional, but it was kind of like, Okay, here we go. Mm. And, you know, over the years, the dreams have kind of chipped away of that. And I'm finding that the dream, the world's a more friendly place. Interesting. You know, I remember years ago seeing, reading that some interviewer once was interviewing Albert Einstein mm. and asked him, he said, of all the questions you've posed into the mysteries of the universe, Mr. Einstein, what, what do you think is the most important question to ask? And Albert Einstein said, is the universe a friendly place or not? Oh, interesting. Because how you answer that question for yourself is going to determine a lot of things. How your life unfolds, how you interpret dreams. Mm. Are they there for your benefit or are they just there to scare the daylights out of you? <laughs> right. Or the nightlights. <laughs> <laughs> the <me>. nightlights. <laughs> um, but that question is really seminal. Is, mm. it, do you perceive that the universe or believe the universe is a friendly, benevolent place ultimately, even though it's full of food chain activity and horrors of its own, you know, mm -hmm. um, or not. Right, right. Well, you know, my, my personal experience is to head toward that the dreams kind of unwind my my negative assumptions. And, mm. uh, and the people I work with, this typical. I've never met a case where somebody got more afraid of the universe as they got deeper into their dreams. Oh, that's so, interesting. So I... I if we're going to vote here, if we're gonna vote, <laughs> I would yeah. say friendly. But there is something about, uh, like, where do the dreams come from? Like, like we have, uh, like, some people say, oh, the dream maker or my higher self, or they come from God. I mean, yeah. they come from the sea of consciousness. I mean, there's, like, there's some way that the dreams often seem to have perspective on my life that I don't have in waking. I don't have in waking life. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I think it was James Hillman. Ring a bell? Um, yeah. Mr. Jungian analyst. Right. He, he said, um, the soul... See, and this may just be another word for what you were describing. The soul contains an image of the way we're supposed to be hmm. and works toward the fruition of that image. Hmm. Um, so there's some part of our psyche, I guess he's saying, that knows what we're capable of. Mm -hmm. This is, I guess, what um, Albert, uh, no, it wasn't. It was um, Maslow talked about self-actualizing types of people, the people who tend to fulfill their potential. Hmm. Um the, I think that's maybe what Hillman is getting at is there's this image of your potential in there. And I think dreams are one of our allies. Mm -hmm. um, that it doesn't always feel that way. <laughs> it's sometimes tough love and all that. But I think they're working toward our our integrity. Mm -hmm. Not in the not in a moral sense. I mean in a psychological sense, yeah. integrity. Yeah. And that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, haven't we all had some experience of meeting somebody in life who um helped move us forward by scaring us in some fashion, challenging us, asking us a really pointed question. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one guy say to me once I was telling him I was terrified of failing at being a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And he leans across the table and he goes, Greg, if you're not failing regularly, uh -huh. man, you're living so far below your potential that you're failing anyway. <laughs> oh, so, right. you know, there's there's mentors, but then there's tormentors. <laughs> tormentors. And well, I that's think, hilarious. I never <laughs> noticed those words. <laughs> yeah. But I think dreams are sort of like that. Yeah. So tricksters. They get the yeah. like tricksters. Oh, that's so funny. I, a, a coyote ran across my path this, this morning coming here. Oh, this morning? Right in oh, front wow. of my car. I, I don't, I've never seen one since I moved to Santa Cruz last year. Oh, that's interesting. The trickster right yep, there. Right there. Uh -huh, hey, yoga. <laughs> uh. So there are around that's interesting yeah yeah that, that can be uh like i had a, a experience of uh i was kind of rushing somewhere like like i talk about all the time on the show it's definitely a thing for me and i pushed past somebody and they said to me this is years and years ago and i always remember this and he says to me are a lot of people in your way today oh <laughs> i was like i was like gosh not only you and but, but then i thought about it and i'm like ooh, mm. ooh. Wow, that I've ne never forgotten that. Insightful comment. Yeah, that was kind of like a dreamlike moment. It's just like, oh, this is what's true. Like, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. those kind of voices are coming through during the night shift. 
<laughs> yes. you know, as well. And uh -huh. there's a whole universe there. It's mm -hmm. like I remember when I first went scuba diving for the first time, I realized, oh, my God, there is as much going on down here as there is in the terrestrial world. Mm. And I feel the same way about dreams. Mm. There is as much going on information and interaction wise as there is in my day to day life. In fact, um, Anne Faraday, I don't know mm. if you recognize that name. She wrote the dream game back in the 70s. Mm. She said, um, dreams are, what was the comment? Dreams are no more dangerous than da daily life. Mm. They're as dangerous as daily life, uh. not, n not more, not less. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a mm. parallel world going on down in there right. and it's crazy to sleep through it <laughs> <laughs> exactly are you sleeping through your dreams All right. yeah. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they do have a life of their own like my whole theme about stage stages and like being on stage and like there's there, i've had many stages of that dream that it goes through evolution you know i've had i've had uh cycles where i've spent six months with water and like dreaming about in the water of over the water under the water like there's a like a relationship and then fire kind of like started bursting through my dreams a year or two ago where mm. for i had quite a few dreams about firefighters like we're gonna put the fire out now that'll be much safer if we just put that fire out huh. and then other dreams where the fire is, is consuming me and I, and i'm like terrified and also exhilarated and so like the they the dreams respond to our attention interesting and mm. i think it's important to you know you're talking about water dreams um Part of the hard human work of dream interpretation is what do I think water means? Not going to a dream dictionary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some useful stuff in there, but um, you know, they a lot of them say dreaming of the ocean, for instance, is dreaming of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. But maybe you know, water is going to mean something really different to somebody who almost drowned as a child. Yes, for instance, than somebody who's more at home in the water than the fish is. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to ask yourself, what does this mean to me? What is my association with fire or with water or with whatever and a particular animal? Uh, yeah. And not just go for the easy fixes, look, flipping through a dream dictionary. Right, right. And that, those sort of things can change over time. Like, how, what is my association with fire in this particular dream? And like, mm. so that's where I go to the feelings based dream work. It's like, I like what does it feel like for me in in this dream moment in this particular relationship to fire so that and is this familiar in some way or is it new and so that oh, to go question. into the feeling there and then i i trust that the dreams are a natural evolutionary process that in, what, they, in what sense that they're something they've evolved with us all animals oh, seem, I... seem like they have dreamlike periods mm. as well birds even seem like they have like these REM states at night mammals um there's something about dreaming that is evolutionarily helpful hmm. otherwise i think we would have lost it you know millions of years ago so i have a theory that um dreams are a part of our emotional immune system emotional immune system yeah that's fascinating so there's some way that they are working even below our consciousness the way our our our, our other kind of immune immune system works below our consciousness and we heal our wounds and uh, we get through our colds without having conscious awareness of, of that immune system so I believe that the dreams are working inside of us, even the ones we don't remember, are still realigning our emotions and our um, our thoughts even, the re re laying down new neuronal pathways mm -hmm. uh, that are helpful to us and that bit by bit that they are sending us in a direction that's helpful and healing wow. us in the same way that our immune system he heals us from wounds and, and disease. Wow. So we don't even have to be aware of that. Even people who don't remember dreams are still are still benefiting from the power of dreams right. but i think by making it conscious then we can enhance that process so there's a there's this comment that makes sense from somebody who believes that the universe is essentially a benevolent place i do mm -hmm. that dreams even when they scare the daylights out of us yeah. um are there for our benefit yeah for our mm -hmm. psychic immune system as you say yeah uh, uh -huh. i mean that's a wonderful take on dreams right there because mm -hmm. even when they scare us they're there to help us grow right they are now, there are cases uh, where the dreams are too much, like in post-traumatic stress mm. syndrome, that they're where, where the, when, when the dream is just is, is precisely the reliving of the trauma over and over again, then there's something that maybe breaks down in the dreaming immune system. There's some way that we just we don't get to move past that. And so I think how there do you, are cases. How do you cases. deal with that? Well, you know, I'm not a scientist. I am a scientist, but I'm not, I'm not a, <laughs> that kind of scientist. I'm not that kind of scientist. <laughs> but the, 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 I've read about the research on this, and it's, it's, it's not clear. 
really. The, but there's uh, Matthew Walker and his associates have done a series of papers about about dreaming and how it helps us emotionally. And he points to this as an example of how the system the system kind of breaks down. There's a way that we kind of get stuck in this this trauma. Um, mm. There was okay. He did. There is. There are certain medications that help because one of the things that happens when we're dreaming for most of us is that uh, I see if I can get this. Remember this. This best of my memory. The uh, our adrenal system is um, is calmed down while we're dream while we're dreaming. The I forget the exactly the terminology, but uh, we can have a really scary dream and yet. You know, that dragon flying over our head, you were terrified. But if that actually happened in waking life, you would be, like, beyond oh, terrified. Yeah. So there's a way that even the scariest dreams for most of us, the adrenal system is suppressed. And so we're not as afraid as we would be if something happened in waking life. Mm. And so there are medications that can help people um, by um, calming down their adrenal system. And then they can, they can actually face the dream images and then they start to evolve. And then once the dreams start to evolve, then the PTSD symptoms start to go away as well. So there are certain kinds of medications mm, that seem to help. And, you know, there's also medications that suppress dreams. And I don't know. Mm. I don't, I'm never a fan of that. Yeah. But I can understand there are cases where it is too much. And I totally respect that. Yeah. And I've never had a PTS experience in the clinical sense. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always seemed to me that if the more we deal with our issues if i can put it that way in waking life the less we're going to be tormented by them in our dreaming life mm -hmm. it's like if you're um running from something in your life you're going to be chased in dreams mm -hmm. if you're tr feeling trapped by something in life you're going to have trapped dreams you know uh, yeah, yeah. and it's and the more that we deal with or i deal with those issues w when i'm awake the less i'm uh, chased by them in my dream life uh, and I've always assumed that there, w there was something about that of dealing with dreams that are say nightmarish things that are recurring mm -hmm. there's something they're asking us to deal with in waking life um, and then they can chill out at yeah. night yeah I've always made that assumption absolutely I, I've, I've had that <clears throat> experience and, and often we may not be aware of that the way we're boxed in in waking life but if we like it happens to me fairly frequently I'll I'll have a dream and then I recognize the syndrome in waking life. But I, but I have the dream first, and the, and the dream imagery is very helpful. I'm hmm. trying to think of an example. Uh, I don't know, but like if I'm being chased by a bear, you know, classic thing. And then I think of when, when, where in waking life do I feel like I'm being chased? Like maybe in one of my typical running late scenarios. Hmm. And if I if I take that dream image of being chased by a bear and I notice in waking life that say I'm rushing okay here's that moment again and then I can bring in the dream image of being chased and I'm like oh it feels like there's like that bear's breathing down my neck right and then it somehow it helps it actually it feels like I'm relaxing a little right now there's like a way of bringing that dream image into waking life that takes the pressure off of the current moment and kind of gives myself a little space a little compassion like no wonder i'm i'm terrified it's a bear right exactly <laughs> and i and i think it's important your comment about bringing some aspect of the dream into waking life yeah like this idea of concretizing it or literally enacting it in some little even a little ritual oh. you know um like the dream of being on stage and then writing my obit in my book and tearing it apart there was a way of physicalizing the dream which was incredibly liberating yeah, for yeah. Me and did in fact help me let go of my attachment to outcome mm, right so the, yeah mm -hmm, yeah embodying it and bringing it into the body that the, the, the our, some ways our body expresses our subconscious issues is the same way the dreams do like like you were like you even were saying like the uh you know I don't want to say diseases or anything, but there's a way like th that uh, nervous tics and things like that can show up in the body if we're not paying enough attention to them in our waking life. Right. So in some ways, the body is is expresses our subconscious the same way dreams do. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, Arnold Mindell, psychologist who started process-oriented psychology, said symptoms, body symptoms, are usually dreams trying to come true. Mm -hmm. That's his phrase. Yeah. All right. And so you look at the body symptom you may be having, whether it's a tick or whether it's something more serious, uh, like what you were experiencing on your on your trip. Mm -hmm. um, and you say you give it a voice mm -hmm. and you let it fill in the blank. So the body's the symptom is talking to you saying, my dream is that you would uh, fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, and there's something really powerful about that. Mm -hmm. My dream is that you would. Now, that's using dreams in a slightly different context. It's like. Um, 
you know, dreams as ambitions. Right. Well, but that's okay. I mean, I think they're related. It's interesting we use the same word for the nighttime dreams and also the the hopes and our aspirations right. for waking life. There's right. some way that 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 is expressing a subconscious something subconscious. Sure, like yeah. your stage dreams. Mm. You know, there's there's probably a dream in you to share your work with the world, maybe to sing, mm. to be a teacher, or have a radio show. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, there is a correspondence between the dream call and the real life call right absolutely oh, wonderful so greg lavoy how can listeners get in touch with you well uh world headquarters is greg lavoy.com <laughs> g-r-e-g-g-l-e-v-o-y uh, but also like you mentioned at the top of the hour i've got a a weekend callings retreat coming up here in santa cruz at 1440 multiversity january 3 through 5 so you can just Google Multiversity and it'll be right there. Right. And so, I, I heard on the radio recently that, that uh, Multiversity is now offering a locals discount that if you live within 50 miles of uh, Multiversity, that you don't have to pay the full price or there's some kind of a uh, help so that you, that you can afford to come. Wonderful. Of, yeah. Great idea. Mm. So do you have any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? Greg? Hmm. Well... I mean, this is just what comes to me. It takes courage to look at dreams the same way it takes courage to examine like a firecracker that didn't go off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and I understand the trepidation involved in looking at dreams, even, you know, the ones that aren't scary and nightmarish. But I just think there is so much wisdom in dreams that it would be um, it would be a shame in terms of just our own evolution, not to look at them. Mm -hmm. There's so much incredible data. It's really like having a, almost like a, a wise person inside of you all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do a little bit of work to interpret their advice. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't always like, like marquee, just tell me what I need to know. Mm -hmm. um, the interpretive arts come in whether you're working with a guru or whether you're working with your own unconscious. But I just encourage people to open up the lid and look in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember Isabel Allende, the, the novelist, once said that she had a trunk with um, pirate stuff and mysterious, weird things for her kids in the basement. And that it was important for people to have a trunk with mysterious mm. items um, in the basement just to charge the imagination. <laughs> and I think dreams fit into that that trunk. Oh, thank you. Oh, I love that. Greg yeah. LaVoy. All right. So... Um, next week, we will be live here again in the studio, and it will be our call-in only show. So I want you guys to get that down on your calendar so we can get some call-ins, get some conversation happening. If you have a dream you're curious about, I'd be happy to explore it with you on the air. And if you miss it, you can always tune in uh, live. Well, and you can tune in live, or if you miss it, you can catch the podcast replay on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Stitcher. Sweet dreams till sun. I am Catherine Bell, and this has been the Dream Journal. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about my dream coach practice at experientialdreamwork.com. I offer private sessions, dream groups, and in-depth retreats. If you have a dream you are curious about, you're welcome to contact me for a free introductory dream consultation. You can reach me at, KSQ, at Catherine at KSQD.org. That's K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E at KSQD.org. Let me know if you have suggestions for interviews or questions about a dream. Or maybe you just want to say hi. If you like this show, please leave us a review on iTunes or tell a friend about the show. Our guest today was Greg Lavoy. I'd also like to thank my program assistant, Max Deaton, and our creative musician, Rick Kleffel, and his live ambient music. And thank you to all the wonderful donors who support this station. K-Squid is 100% listener-supported, and donations are always welcome at ksqd.org. That's all for the Dream Journal. Join us again next Saturday at 10 a.m., and when you wake up tomorrow morning, take a minute to look within. Do you remember a dream? Write it down and bring it to the next Dream Journal. Are you ready to wake up to the power of your dreams? I'm Catherine Bell, and you are listening to KSQD. Santa Cruz.